Well, thank you all so much for joining us um, this afternoon for our, our panel. Really excited about the conversation that we're gonna have today. I wanna start off with just a couple of, of, of kind of overarching points. Um, according to the fourth national climate assessment, the risk associated with climate change are often highest for those who are already vulnerable, including low to moderate income communities, some communities of color, children, and the elderly. Additionally, some BIPOC or LMI communities can be five to 20 degrees hotter than predominantly white neighborhoods in the very same city. Environmental and Environmental inequities are so pervasive in low-income communities and communities of color that environmental experts have used the term sacrifice zones to describe these areas that carry a greater burden of air, land, and water pollution and warmer temperatures because they are situated near chemical uh, treatment plants, highways, and or heavy polluters. I know that unfortunately, neither of those two statements is particularly new news for most of you joining this session to. Uh, this afternoon, but I think it's helpful to hear some of the specifics as we work to double down on why this work is important and why we need even greater climate justice solutions yesterday. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Danielle Burns. I'm the Vice President and Head of Business Development at CNOTE, and I'm delighted to be here with each of you today. Our conversation is going to be focused on helping each of us to better understand how community investments can address climate change, specifically the unequal impact climate change has on underserved communities. I'm joined by a fantastic group of colleagues this afternoon who have deep passion and expertise on this topic, and I will allow each of them to introduce themselves. However, very briefly on the panel with me today is Melissa, Melissa Weber. Melissa is the Sustainability Director at Self-Help Credit Union and Ventures Fund. Netta Arab Shahani. Netta is the Director of Inclusive Center for Resiliency and Clean Energy. Michael Galopter. Michael is, the clean, is a climate justice expert and um, uh, the, the CEO of the Brazilian, uh, I'm sorry, for the Managing Director of Reflective Earth, and Arulio Arroyo, he is the direct Executive Director of the Cooperative uh, Jesus Barrel in Puerto Rico. So thank you to each of our panelists for being here. Um, before we get started, we wanted to just do a really quick uh, pulse check for those of you joining us today. It'd be great to know uh, who might be new to climate justice conversations and who's sort of been at this critical work for some time. So if you could just indicate in the chat, um, you know, whether you're a novice or you're an, you know, been at this work for, uh, you know, you're an expert or an uh, intermediate, that would be great. And also let us know uh, where you hail from. That would be fantastic. So I'm going to turn it over to Michael, and he's going to kick off our conversation today. So, Michael. Hi. Thanks. Thank you very much, Danielle. And I'm going to share my screen real quick. Um, I, I don't work directly on – I work on uh, doing things in communities right now, not driven yet by investment, but hopefully. So I'm the managing director of Reflective Earth. I've been working on climate change since the mid-'80s and on climate justice since 1995. And um, in the last few years, I sort of want to give a little bit of an overview about why I think investment is so critical. Um, for really more than a decade, it's been clear to those of us doing climate work and climate justice work that there is that the costs of getting ready and adapting and being resilient are staggering. Um, and uh, I'll give a couple of examples why. Um, the uh, this is a map of the what's called the low elevation coastal zone in Bangladesh. Uh, it's estimated that Bangladesh will be 60% underwater for a large portion of the year by the end of, the cent of this century uh, on just moderate climate change paths. And these are large population centers you see there. Um, with some likely, uh, with, the, with the loss of what's called the West Ar Antarctic ice shelf, this is a conservative projection, these red zones our conservative projection of the places that will be underwater in the United, in the United States. Um, and I'll just give you a little, just a simulation that was done recently for Boston, right? Here's what Boston looks like today. Here's what it looks like conservatively by the end of this, by the end of the century. Uh, and you can see visually on the left and then, uh, and then up topographically on the right. And here's what it looks like um, if we don't, if we continue kind of, on a path that's only slightly better than we're on right now. That is the same, more like two to 2.5 degrees Celsius in warming. So um, 
The challenge here, I think, for folks doing climate justice work is to say, okay, is it really just about mobilizing capital from rich countries to poor countries and rich neighborhoods to poor neighborhoods? And I was pretty depressed about it for a while. And I was able to, I had a long conversation with, uh, several long conversations with water and water infrastructure people, in particular folks um, in cities that have historic, that have very long histories and countries that have very long histories with water challenges. And what they said was that, that yes, the capital costs were daunting, but they all delivered very good returns. If we shifted the investment horizon from kind of a property flipping, you know, buy a building, flip it in three years framework to more of a social and human capital framework um, with a six to eight year horizon. So, you know, for example, if we think about my hometown, New York City, uh, if there are two to three Hurricane Sandys in a decade, the subway system becomes very, very marginal. Um, and you think about what does that mean for storekeeping? You know, the pandemic obviously has been a preview of how hard it's been for small businesses and others. But you think about um, what do we do? And if we start investing now in resilience, if we start investing now in where we know the ball is going, the fact that there will be more hurricanes, the fact that our transit systems will transit systems will be more vulnerable, that certain types of housing, basement apartments and other things will be more vulnerable. It's possible to convert um, all of really every city, including the ones in Bangladesh, into places that have adapted and are resilient to what's coming and what will be. Um, and that those even can be strengths of sources of strength and growth for communities. So when we see the daunting task of the overwhelming impact that climate is going to have, we have to realize that there are places like Venice, there are places like uh, Amsterdam. Uh, I'll give you an example. The Dutch have controlled 80% of waterborne traffic in Europe commercially since the 12th century. Um, so if you think about a problem as an opportunity, um, if we think about our communities as needing to evolve, um, of finding new surface transit systems that are flood resilient, new types of housing that are climate and heat and flood resilient. Um, these become opportunities. Um, people can flock to cities, flock to places to see how they've changed, how they're adapting to how the world is changing around them, even though we wish the world wasn't changing as much or as fast. And the key really is changing investment regimes. And most of what I work on is the politics of that raising these issues and saying capital flows are going to have to change. People are going to have to make money differently in urban areas. We can't afford to just, you know, basically sell out New York City to hedge funds in the hope that they'll stick around and we can collect enough rich people's taxes to pay for a new subway system. That's not going to work. We have to build community investment structures. We have to see where the ball is going, adapt and create new, beautiful, vibrant places based on where our planet will be and is going now. At Reflective Earth, briefly, I'll just say we are working specifically on the question of what's called technically albedo, what we like to call it reflectivity. It's a little bit like mRNA for climate. It's the fastest thing you can do about heating is to reduce the amount of sunlight that hits the planet or hits surfaces. I won't get into the technicalities of it, but this is a map of the places in the world that are most uh, that can contribute the most to cooling the planet by becoming more reflective. We don't want polar ice caps melting. We want them staying white and shining lots of light back to space. But at a local level, this is the city of Los Angeles. We're launching a map in a, right after Glasgow with the city of Los Angeles, where they actually have done satellite monitoring of the reflectivity of all, every roof in the city. We can put a number on that and help people adapt. There are actually subsidies in the city to do it. We're working in Dakar right now to create grassroots roof conversions. At a local and regional level, you can shave two to four degrees Celsius off an extreme heat day, radically reducing heat deaths simply by painting a significant amount or converting a significant amount of surfaces to being more reflective. And by the way, the industries involved are just not mobilized at all. Shade fabric, paint, roof materials, paving materials industries, just they're not even half aware that they're going to be playing such a critical role in keeping our spaces livable. But these are conversion opportunities. These are investment opportunities for small businesses. But the mega message really is that, um, you know, you're not just going to turn a city white and go, oh, look, we're done. It's going to change the character of the city. It's about the community and the human and the social capital, the aesthetic, the arts, the culture. Um, and tying that together in a, in a community investment framework is really the only way that we can afford, and frankly, not just afford, but thrive through the transition we're going to have to go through over the next 50 to 100 years. And with that, I'll pass it on to Nita. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much, Michael. So I'm also going to share my screen. Let's see. Okay, great. 
All right, great, thanks. So I'm Neda Arab Shahi, I direct the Inclusive Center for Resiliency and Clean Energy, and I'll be speaking about what credit unions are doing to address climate readiness. And it kind of speaks to what Michael was mentioning in terms of mobilizing investment capital in the places that need it the most. Um, so Inclusive is um, a nonprofit organization and our mission is to help low and moderate income people and communities achieve financial independence through credit unions. We're a national network of community development credit unions. We're certified CDFI. And since 1974, we've been leading, we've been the leading credit union resource for financial inclusion and community development. And along the way, we realized that our members and the communities that we serve were really being hit hard by the impacts of climate change. So about a year and a half ago, we launched the Inclusive Center for Resiliency and Clean Energy. And through that, we're building a network of community-based lenders, credit unions, loan funds, community banks that are developing and offering affordable financing solutions for clean energy, specifically to combat climate change, but also to build more resilient communities. So through the center, we offer training, um, access to collaborative operating platforms, investment vehicles, loan participation opportunities, um, looking at possibilities for secondary markets, and we also do advocacy work. And you can see Melissa here in this photo, our fellow speaker on this panel today, she was a student in our solar finance training course. Um, so we see that there has been a significant global investment increase in clean energy. In 2020, there was over $500 billion invested into the energy transition, which was a 9% increase over 2019. And you can kind of look down the slide in, there was an increase in investment in renewables, increase in investment in solar. And in the U.S. solar market, there has been dramatic growth. In 2006, there were 31,000 homes with solar. Today, there are over 3 million homes with solar, and that market is expected to double by 2023. And in addition, I'm sure many have heard President Biden has called for 100% of the nation's electricity to come from clean energy by 2035. So... We see that there's significant opportunity for growth and significant opportunity for investment. We also realize that there are communities that we're most trying to serve that continue to have um, the need for clean energy and access to climate friendly solutions, but they do not have the financing and they've been largely left out of this increase in investment. So. Um, we, I wanted to highlight the concept of energy burden, which is when, which is the percent of gross household income that's spent on energy costs. Um, in this country, the average energy burden for low-income households is three times higher than for non-low-income households. And on top of that, um, Black households on average spend 43% more of their income on energy costs than white households. Hispanic households spend 20% more, and Native American households spend 45% more. Um, so we, we know that this disproportionate energy burden is hitting our most vulnerable communities. We also know that credit unions do have a very strong history of supporting those same communities. They're often supporting communities that have lacked access to clean energy. Credit unions also tend to have deep community relationships. They have the financing and loan underwriting experience, and there are over 5,000 credit unions across the U.S. with combined assets of 1.7 trillion, serving over 113 million members. So um, through the center, but also just before the center existed, credit unions had been starting to build a significant green lending track record. And... Um, I wanted to just quickly state what, what I mean by green lending. So I'm talking about financing projects that reduce household energy burden, greenhouse gas emissions, energy use, water use. They could be clean energy like solar or wind. They could be low carbon vehicles or building energy efficiency, such as a new efficient boiler. So we've seen that... Um, Right now, across the country, over 292 credit unions and cooperativas based in Puerto Rico offer green loan products. 
these lenders are able to right now that most of them are getting started, but they are able to and will be able to dramatically grow their investment in green lending. Um, they currently have combined assets of over 283 billion and are serving more than 17 million members. And the important part is that 61% of these institutions are either community development financial institutions, low income designated or minority depositories. And so they are serving just those populations that are being impacted by disproportionate energy burden. So we see a really strong connection between the capacity of credit unions to get involved and help drive financing in this space. I also wanted to mention that 21% of these lenders have taken our solar lending training program that we offer through the University of New Hampshire. Um, oh. Sorry. And, uh, and with that, I'm going to pass it over to Melissa. Um, and thank you very much. Thanks, Netta, for the handoff. Somebody let me know if the sound quality is not strong here while I get my uh, slides shared. You sound okay, Melissa. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. What a million years into the virtual environment, and we're all still <laughs> messing with our microphones. So Absolutely, glad, glad to be here. I'm with Self Help Credit Union and Ventures Fund. We're a community development finance institution. That's a breed of lender that is special purpose built to flow capital into the communities that have traditionally been shut out from access to fair financial services. And in particular, we focus on low income and communities of color and rural communities and um, organizations led by women and people of color. For purposes of this conversation, we do not invest in projects involving fossil fuel extraction or production, and that's important for our members and our investors who are increasingly motivated by divesting themselves from fossil fuel investments. Whoops. Hey, get back here. What we do is invest in clean energy, ecotourism, land conservation, affordable homes, and green buildings. So a portfolio of what we call sustainable development-oriented projects. And so of self-helps, $10 billion of impact over the decades of our history, 409 million of that has been invested in these, these umbrella categories that you would, that follow either the UN Sustainable Development Goals or other kinds of green lending targets. And increasingly, we're called to focus on climate targets. So we've, um, for instance, participated in the inclusive solar lender training course in order to figure out how are we going to extend our consumer lending to our members who are generally low-income people. And that's not really a typical credit risk. So this is very much a new horizons. This is cutting edge or maybe bleeding edge of um, credit policy, of uh, cre extending credit. We try uh, to support our borrowers and attract borrowers who come to us motivated to build low impact buildings with a low carbon footprint that are inexpensive to operate from an energy perspective. And we work really hard in our own projects so that we've got credibility to offer technical assistance to our borrowers by doing projects, um, catalytic neighborhood projects and demonstrating energy efficiency or solar energy on our own buildings. Tree preservation, I think, is a sleeper issue in real estate, make note of that. Um, Another issue that we work pretty hard to integrate into our own practices and our own business, our real estate projects, our purchasing goals for minority and women-owned business enterprises. And it's really important to us to carry those goals along with our green goals so that we are bringing along all of our values and all of our mission when we're building green projects. So lessons learned in the course of um, trying lots of 
lots and lots of different ways to get at these goals and have these kinds of impacts um, is that the numbers won't always pencil. And it's really tempting to imagine, particularly as a lending institution, that if we only find the right project structure, if we only get technical enough or get the right credit enhancement, that we're not going to have to take different risks than what we already are accustomed to taking. And that's not the case. The numbers will not always pencil. There's also often going to be a need for subsidy because there's no price on carbon. Currently, pollution is free. That means if you're going to build a project that has a lower carbon footprint than this other project next door, you might need subsidy. Maybe you're going to make it work through energy savings, but those energy savings occur in the future and you got a project budget you got to work with right now. So subsidy, I think, is going to remain a very important piece of the project, of the landscape, for quite a while. And I think that's really important for investors to grapple with. And finally, I'll add a lesson learned that policy is going to be crucial. Um, the example here on this slide, my um, perhaps not obvious, the the photograph of the utility scale solar arrays out in the pretty green fields, those pencil, they pencil pretty good because they've got contracts from a major utility and the price of the solar equipment has come down and there is a well-oiled machine pouring investment tax credit funds from institutional investors into projects like that. The Picture on the right is a retreat, a, a nonprofit organizing center in rural Durham County near where I live. And the utility policy up there is really not favorable. They're making it really, really hard for us to put clean energy at any kind of scale on this building. So policy is going to remain a crucial place of engagement for lenders and practitioners who want to make clean energy happen and reach that better world that Michael was talking about. I want to share four different ways that investors have engaged with self-help and many other CDFIs, community development finance institutions, to make green lending happen. So the first one is the simplest. We, as a depository institution, self-help offers a product called a, a green CD. It's a FDIC insured market rate deposit account. And a lot of investors um, park their cash there. It's not like super exciting, but at this, but it's an awesome place for investors to, um, to put cash that aligns with their values. Second item, share secure alone is I think a sleeper issue. The it's it's kind of like the situation where a grandparent might put up a lien on their savings account in order to enable their grandchild to buy a car. And grandchild is going to buy the car and if they don't and the credit union knows that if the grandchild somehow gets flaky, grandma's behind that loan. So we've experienced that with a nonprofit with the um, Green Building Council in Western North Carolina. They wanted to secure loans so that neighborhood participants could get small loans to insulate their houses in a work swap kind of a program. And the credit risks were weird, but we realized we had this car lending program for grandparents and we repurposed that for the Green Building Association to put a grant into enabling neighborhood participants to buy insulation and caulk guns. Moving down my uh, sketch here um, in, let's say, complexity, investors can get a lot of bang for, have gotten a lot of bang for their buck with CDFIs by providing low interest capital through program-related investments of varying terms. The longer, the more impactful, the lower interest, the more impactful. And then finally, the, um, a, there's an ability to fund a loan loss reserve or provide credit enhancement 
to a CDFI. And the again, the longer term, the lower, the higher value of credit enhancement, the more impactful it can be and the bigger risks the institution can take with those funds. So I will leave it at that and hand off to Aurelio to tell us what's going on from his part of the world. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Melissa. And great presentation of all my fellow um, presenters. Let me see if I could connect right now with my screen. OK, perfect. OK. Hi, everyone. And I start with the beginning. OK, I want to present. My name is Aurelio Arroyo González. I'm CEO of Cooperativa Jesús Obrero, or Jesús Obrero Cooperativa, the commercial name. And we are located in Guaynabo, Puerto Rico. We are part of an uh, ecosystem of, of great unions, or local cooperativas. We prefer to call cooperativas to express uh, the a special uh, characteristic that we present uh, in Puerto Rico. We are a financial institution, community-owned financial institution that are regulated, locally regulated, but are also we have to, uh, to comply with uh, every uh, regulation and rules and law uh, that any financial institution in U.S. jurisdiction. I want to present the solar energy and affordable housing, how cooperativas, financial response, uh, what, what is the financial response of the cooperativas into climate change in Puerto Rico? Uh, I don't know if, if everybody knows, Puerto Rico saw the obvious phase of, of climate change in 2017 with uh, the stroke of uh, two major hurricanes, category five hurricanes, Irma and Maria. Uh, I will I will express. I will I want to present uh, two examples how cooperativas are doing uh, in the reconstruction of the island, uh, specifically in terms of solar lending or solar uh, financing, and in terms of affordable housing. Um, I want to. Uh, to talk about uh, Jesus Obrero a little bit. We were founded in 1959. We have uh, 110 million assets, um, serving 11, uh, 11,400 members. We are a CDFI, CDFI since 2019 and inclusive par part of inclusive uh, members since 2018. We have, and I, before to start, before starting, talking about uh, the impact of the hurricanes and the reconstruction in 2017, I want to express that we have layers of difficulties, layers of constraints in all our economy. We have an island crisis and the climate change economic context. Puerto Rico has been under an economic recession since 26, 2006. In past decade, we lost around 60% of the population. Most of them moved from uh, to Florida, to Texas, and other jurisdictions in other states in the U.S. Uh, we were expecting that in 2010, we have, we have almost 4 million of inhabitants, and we start losing population uh, in the past decade. The island's infrastructure has been degraded to unsustainable levels, with electrical grid having the greatest negative impact in the life, on the lives of Puerto Ricans. Uh, our electrical grid were, uh, was served by a state-owned monopoly that went, went bankrupt in six years ago. So the state is bankrupt, uh, and our state-owned uh, monopoly from generation to emission distribution went bankrupt also. You, ha you don't have... Uh, our our infrastructure are are in very weak condition. Uh, the electrical infrastructure are very weak. And before, uh, after, uh, in in 2017, we were impacted, uh, stroke violently by two category five hurricanes, uh, Irma and Maria. Uh, everybody remember Maria. The impact in Maria. Of, uh, of the hurricanes in 2017 were incredible uh, to the island. Over 3,000 people died directly related with the impact or in interruption of essential services. Um, we experienced the longest, longest blackout in, in history of the United States or jurisdiction. Uh, 
Um, in here in our institution, we experienced uh, almost five months with our energy only working with generators. Um, hospitals are working, we're working with generators also, and there is a lot of interruptions with the, with the services that impact the health of the people, and, uh, and that's why uh, uh, a lot of people die. Because, because the impact, of the direct or the indirect uh, relation, the impact of the, of the hurricanes. We also suffer a considerable damage over telecommunication water infrastructure. That because the, the, um, because the lack of energy or the weak uh, infrastructure of energy all around the island. Also, it's estimated that the natural phenomenon, with the greatest economic impact in US history, over 94 billion in dollars were Maria. I prefer to call natural phenomenon, not natural disaster, because I consider that the natural disaster is a human that impact the nature, not the, the nature itself. More than 786,000 houses suffered any damage. Over 60% of all houses in the island. There is, a, there is it is a official statistic about the impact in the houses. That's why I prefer to go. I, I want to, to express uh, two examples of the reconstruction and how cooperativas are doing in this, uh, in this uh, very, uh, uh, very uh, difficult environment. Cooperativas, uh, as a community owned financial institution, as a credit union, everywhere uh, are have values and have principles to reproduce about the cooperative system. But in Puerto Rico, uh, we are going in another, in the opposite direction from the economy. And we are, I consider that we are stubborn. Uh, we, uh, currently around 1.1 million of Puerto Ricans are members of one of 110 cooperativas. Um, that it represents one third of the population. It makes Puerto Rico one of the jurisdictions in the world where more people per capita are cooperatives members. So it's very important that that um, that uh, statistic because only three private banks are serving the island right now. Which uh, when you when you join the the assets of all cooper of, of cooperatives in the island, we became in the third financial we are re, uh, right now the third financial conglomerate in the island. So the people needs us, and and the con the constraints that the economic and the and the um, the climate change uh, climate change impact over the island. Uh, that produce in our population and in producing our community and our, our people uh, has to be served by uh, or, or needs, uh, everyday needs most from a cooperativa or a financial institution near the, the, the destiny of every, of every community. After 2017 hurricanes, cooperativas have increased their membership by over 20% and their assets by approximately 25%. I consider it the most important statistic. Why cooperativas are doing better than any other financial institution in the mid of a, of a state bank, a bankrupt state and in the midst of financial uh, of sorry of financial constraint on the island in the midst of economic crisis in the midst of uh, infra infrastructure crisis why cooperatives are doing very well and is very important because it is related as the uh, related to the answers that we have been giving to the climate change issues. This is that's why those those two examples that I want to present for my, more than a decade, cooperatives have developed a solar energy financing model on the island. Where while private banks were not interested in this market or looked for financial alternative, the cooperative began to supply this need locally, creating a, port, a, a Puerto Rico in Puerto Rico a solar energy industry right now. Cooperativa were the first uh, financial institution that in, pre, uh, pay interest to uh, to start financing solar energy projects, not only residential, but also small and medium enterprises all around the island. After hurricane in 2017, there is not only need to finance solar energy project for economic purposes for for to reduce the electric bill. Because more, more, more people has uh, had access to financial uh, to finance 
solar energy project for their homes or their business looking for reducing uh, uh, the electric bill. But now it's a term of quality of life. It's a term of life. It's, 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 it's a, life, a life issue. Because after hurricanes, the people has a weak, a, a weak, uh, a weak service, an uh, unstable service, and this is a, a, a quality of life matter for uh, most of the families uh, right now, uh, in 2017, and right now is very important. There are increased number of cooperatives that produce solar energy through solar panels, as mentioned, Melissa. We also provide our space to create, to, we have uh, uh, to, to uh, produce our own energy, not only as to reduce our bills, which is very important, but also to serve as a showcase to the community, to, 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 to create a connection with the people, the people uh, believe uh, and, and pay trust that we have, uh, have confidence that it is feasible and it is uh, affordable for them also, and is important for the community. Another example is the cooperative of an affordable housing right now. After hurricanes, remember that 700, 786,000 houses uh, suffered uh, damages in the hurricane. After hurricane 2017, a large segment of low to moderate income population were left without adequate housing and were displaced. Most of them uh, flew away the island. Most of them stay here. But which one has to stay here and suffer the worst part? Our elderly, millennials, and blue-collar workers were left without the possibility of having adequate housing to protect them from the impact of natural phenomena, bringing, a, bringing with it a stability and hope of progress. They broke the hope that they have in the progress of the, in the life. Uh, low to moderate uh, uh, people that uh, incomes uh, has no ability to access to uh, affordable housing. Now, the federal and local government created a very attractive down payment assistance program for people displaced by hurricanes started last year. To date, Cooperativa has provided over 70%. Remember, we are only the third conglomerate, financial conglomerate, but we provide 70% of the mortgage, mortgage loans granted with this program where average loans range from 70,000 to 80,000. Why? Because large bank, private banks has no interest to serve that market. So that's why important also to, uh, to, to have this, uh, this, uh, this uh, network of financial cooperatives or cooperativas or community owned financial institution is local capital state locally. My conclusions, Presenting this in this presentation, uh, this is these two examples demonstrate the importance of community-owned financial institutions part of the critical infrastructure seeking alternative to the impact of climate change in the island. Remember, only three three private banks, 110 cooperativas all around the island. The logic placed in practice with cooperativas and community-based capital is to persist persist in their own existence against all odds. We are not going anywhere else. We can take our luggage and flew away. We have to persist and to adapt to the needs of our people. And one of the uh, and the needs of our people are related, much of them, uh, in, in a proportion, in a, a, a bigger proportion every day to climate change. That's why we are here. That's why uh, we are presenting right now. Thank you for the for the opportunity and and pass uh, the moderation to Daniel. Hey, Julio, thank you so much. I uh, appreciate that. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the work that each of us um, are doing is really about being of service to others and helping others live the best life possible, ensuring that our communities are safe, our children are able to live happy, healthy, whole lives, and that communities and the individuals that live in those communities have the tools and the resources they need to thrive and be successful. Um, at C-Note, this belief is at the center of everything that we do. C-Note, we are a women-led, women-founded social enterprise uh, where our mission is to close uh, the wealth gap through financial innovation. We partner with CDFI loan funds, credit unions, minority and minority deposit institutions to, get, to help get them access to fair and patient capital. 
And when we partner with these organizations, um, we are specifically working to change a narrative around how investors and organizations think about supporting communities through their investment dollars. With regards to climate justice, um, we're currently exploring uh, in partnership with Ned and her team at Inclusive ways that we can help provide deeper education support and resources um, to CDFI to really help provide them the tools that they need to better assess how they engage with communities on issues like uh, solar lending and helping to create a pathway to, to even greater climate lending solutions. Um, and we're also really, you know, excited to be working with Melissa and her team at, at Self Help, um, as we heard before, and they're doing such amazing work in climate justice space. Um, here at CNOTE, we believe our work, uh, quite frankly, though, is only as good as the people whose lives uh, we can help make a difference in. Um, and a couple of ways that we're seeing our um, investors' dollars and actions is through capturing the stories of impact, really, and how community investments actually make a difference in real time. And just really quickly, I'd love to share a, a one quick story um, with um, with the community investment, how it made a difference in, in an individuals and in their community's lives. Um, the story is um, about a woman by the name of Melissa Gladden. She started a, a company called Eco Group of the Carolinas with the help of um, a C-Note CDFI partner, Natural Capital Investment Fund. Um, after years of working in the hospitality industry, Melissa started uh, EcoClean of Asheville, which is a full service rental and vacation home cleaning enterprise that specializes in non-toxic cleaning products that are safe for water systems and the environment. Um, she later expanded that um, business into a laundromat in Western North Carolina, which I find amazing, interesting in that it's the only solar powered, environmentally friendly business in that area. It's called Solar Suds. Um, and so with the financing from that CDFI partner, uh, she was able to purchase the building. She acquired new energy efficient washer and dryers, installed solar panels um, that really cover the entire square footage of the building. Um, and she's also able to uh, create jobs within the community. So it's truly a win-win. And so stories of, of, of entrepreneurs who are realizing their dreams and creating healthier, you know, more environmentally focused businesses and communities, um, you know, why we do that work. Um, and it's often that these businesses also increase local business more broadly, which encourages more people to stay um, in the communities. And so these stories are really fantastic examples of how, you know, community finance organizations are stewards of their local communities. Um, and, and, and at CNOTE, it's really a privilege to be able to work with these finance community finance organizations, not only to promote their work and tell their story, but actually allow investors to access, access those organizations and make investments or deposits to support them in their work. So we are coming right up on the top of the hour. Um, and so we've had so much, you know, amazing things that we've discussed. Um, and I just, I really want to, um, I think I um, have just one question. I'll quickly ask the panelists to give me a 30 second response um, as we close out, you know, for those of us, you know, for the folks joining us in the room today, what is one piece of advice um, that you would give on how um, individuals or organizations can get involved in climate justice and take action today. And we'll start with Netta. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I think that there are so many projects that can be supported um, through platforms like CNOTE, through your local credit union. There are many ways that you can kind of invest and even uh, even possibly make some money back in local clean energy projects. Great. Thank you. Michael? Thank you. Yeah, I would also say um, uh, look at what your local planning agencies and local climate folks are telling you about how your community is going to change, the risks that are there, and think about how you can turn those into opportunities. Great. Thank you. Melissa? I'd say look through your whole portfolio, um, both your organizations and your own um, personal finances, including retirement accounts, and start moving your money where your values are as far as carbon. Great, thank you. And Aurelio? We are starting uh, starting the process to access uh, secondary capital through Inclusive. Inclusive are helping us, uh, incredible team of Inclusive are helping us to create a secondary capital market uh, needed to expand our access 
to our community, expand our products and services to, to the people that need it the most. Fantastic. Panelists, thank you so much for, for your time and talent um, in the conversation this afternoon. Thank you so much to SoCap for having us and enjoy the rest of the conference. Have a good day.